Hey everybody. Now I've got all my pictures from the last couple of years of high school. Don't have much to represent ninth and 10th grade. However, if you watched my Taekwondo video um, where I tested for my uh, first degree black belt and I had the long hair, that's what I look like in 10th grade. Now the one bit picture I do have of myself from ninth grade, I got that confused with my middle school pictures because I pretty much look like that the whole time. Right? And that's me in 11th grade, age 17, and that's me in 12th grade. That's me with my best friend Janet Skarabinski. At that time I had a tendency to make friends with the kids whose uh, parents were in the military. Um, it wasn't always easy to make friends with the locals there, they had what you called the Bubba system. In fact, this is something that my father talked about. <laughs> so, like, it wasn't easy to make friends at work for that reason. And, and so the Navy kids had a similar issue, you know, it's like they were always the new kid. And so I made friends with a lot of Navy kids and Janet was one of them. So Janet moved to the Key West uh, Navy base housing area in, um, from San Diego and we made friends over my skinny puppy t-shirt. Before that, we had gone to see skinny puppy. I was about 16, going on 17. That was the first time I really got to go out and see a band that we were listening to at home, like skinny puppy, you know? And so my mom, my dad, me, my cousin, and a good friend from high school all went to this show. And funny thing is, is um, as we were getting in at the door, the security guy there was teasing my parents for being our chaperones. And my dad laughed about that so much just because um, he was like the biggest skinny puppy fan there. He's the, the reason we were all even at that concert, right? Yeah, so by going to that show, that's where I started to find my identity. And so my favorite punk, my favorite punk haircut, other than the mohawk, would be the undercut. And so I did an undercut where I left some fuzz because I like to pet my fuzzy hair. And I would uh, take the rest of it and stand it up and kind of comb it backwards and put a lot of gunk in it. And, you know, that's a lot of work. So I, I quit doing that and started wearing it more uh, flat-wise. And there I had my psychic pendant uh, made by the guy uh, from Denver who uh, was running the, the topi out there. And then I was trying to dress more industrial style. I think my dad brought that pendant from his trip in 88. And then Janet was from the San Diego area, and um, and she was showing me her side of underground music. So, at that time, New Order was my favorite band. So about the age 12 to 18, um, I was like really into New Order. And then when I met her, she was really into Depeche Mode. And so she was showing me the side of music, or I'd say underground music, that I wasn't seeing at home. Because it was I would consider more like the trendy side, you know, like... First of all, Depeche Mode, uh, Pet Shop Boys, uh, Erasure, anything like that. My dad didn't like anything that was too clubby or trendy. So she was also enlightening me on the rave scene that was starting to grow. And, you know, she also had a boyfriend that was a DJ and was already going to those types of parties. So it was um, a good friend of mine throughout that, that, uh, that year in high school. Now, by that time, I found that most of my friends and um, my cousins weren't really into the music that me and my dad were listening to. And, you know, Janet, though, she uh, let me talk about it all I want. And so, you know, when we were in art class and it was time to make a kite, I made a new order kite. Now, <laughs> I was kind of making fun of Bernard Sumner a little bit because um, he opens his mouth really big. And, um, and, you know, when he started out, he just wasn't a very good singer. As I had mentioned in a previous video, I kind of think um, our favorite singers and artists and other sorts of uh, people, we like them because we see a little bit of ourselves in those people, right? Well, anyways, if you go back and look at the Joe Division, Joy Division videos, I talk a lot about that. Anyways, when it was time to make paper mache, Janet's like, hey, why don't you make New Order Singer? So again, um, I made a really good... Bernard Sumner doll, gave him a microphone and a guitar, and I made him look like from the video in Perfect Kiss. Now, 
I didn't feel comfortable showing this stuff to my dad because I felt like um, between him and my cousins, they were making me feel kind of ashamed of my new order thing, you know. So I ended up packing it up and sending it to Janet after she moved back to San Diego. Unfortunately, when her um, nieces and nephews got a hold of it, um, they wanted to see if they could take the guitar off and put it back on, and, and they ended up ripping it apart. Now here's some pictures. Uh, <laughs> I kind of put all the Polaroids together, but the only one that represents that year would be when I was working at Winn-Dixie, you know, and something I learned from Janet was dyeing my hair, and I also got into wearing Doc Martens, right? So I worked at Winn-Dixie, and she worked over at uh, the record store, and my father has always had ferrets. Now, um, that's the year I met the cute guy in the Navy, about a couple years older than me. And there he was, um, he would have been behind me. But since he dumped me, I cut him out of the picture. Well, it was good timing, because, you know, um, I'd already noticed that he, he drives awfully fast on his uh, crotch rocket with me on the back, and I had confronted him about that. And, uh, well, he ended up dumping me, you know, because probably just, yeah, we weren't meant to be together, so it was time to move on. And the timing was pretty good. Um, unfortunately, um, he was drinking and driving with his new girlfriend, and they ended their lives on Dead Man's Curve, as we called it. So if you were coming into Key West off of Stock Island and go left, there's some very dangerous curves down that way. So um, unfortunately, um, he passed. So um, I had a pretty basic, typical relationship with him, you know. And my dad really didn't like the idea of me screwing, screwing a squid. But we broke up before that happened, and um, wow, wow, wow. That just made me realize how close high had come, right? Yeah, another cool thing during the age of 17, um, being in high school, see, I actually tried to dress up and wear makeup, um, and I had another good friend I met in art class named Simone. Yes, I started talking to Simone, and he was from up north, from Montreal, and he was doing the Chinese boxing with Ron Curran, so um, he showed me a little bit of that, and that's how I ended up going to those classes, so... Um, yeah, um, so thankfully I'm still in touch with Simone. I hope he watches this video. Hi there if you're watching. Um, and he ended up moving back up north and uh, becoming a professional artist. Anyways, um, moving on. So this would be me at age 18. Um, I couldn't get that color out of my hair, so I ended up having to shave it all off. I think my head was all shaved off right there. Anyways, um, yeah, so age 18. Uh, that summer was a big summer. As you might imagine, turning 18 is a big deal for anyone. So that summer, my dad bought us a quarter bag of mushrooms and we split it. And we watched A Clockwork Orange. Yeah, my birthday present was being sent up to Orlando to the Lollapalooza. The Lollapalooza. I was going up to see Front 242. They were one of our favorite bands around that time. Well, turns out Front 242 was really the only band that I cared for that was at the Lollapalooza. Um, Tool was okay. I kind of liked them a little bit. Otherwise, I got a really bad sunburn and um, I tried to sneak my sandwiches in my hat. Well, when I got up too close to the, because uh, they wouldn't let us bring food and I snuck food in my hat. I had this big old uh, black hat. I got too close to the stage and they were spraying water on the, uh, the concert goers and they ruined all my sandwiches. So I didn't have much to eat and I didn't have much money to spend. <laughs> Anyways, um, that was kind of made up to me the next winter when we got to see Front 242 down in Miami. Another interesting point the year I turned 18 is um, I remember my dad coming back with them um, and I just happened to have a copy of Sideline. Well, he had a copy of Sideline with Bill Lieb on the front. And he said something like, well, isn't that your little friend from down the street? And um, so that's the year when I realized um, this might be the person I had been having uh, visionary state experiences throughout my uh, childhood. Um, so if you go into the Jody Vision uh, playlist, I did a bunch of videos where I had this little boyfriend named Billy. And it turns out that he is... <laughs> Billy but Frontline Assembly. So that's when I started realizing, oh my god, these guys might be the same person. And so, um, yeah, that was, um, it kind of makes me aware of where my head was at when, you know, I reflect on these moments, right? So you see my dad, um, was a music collector. Um, that's like probably all of his tapes and most of his 45s when there's just a small portion of 
his CDs and albums, and I was goofing around with an ace band, you know, kind of in a roundabout way, maybe I'm saying <laughs> I know I'm a head case, and that's why I wrapped my head in that ace bandage, right? And then that's the hat I was talking about, I hid those sandwiches in. <laughs> But yeah, you know, the thing about Billy is it has always kind of uh, planted the seed of thought of like, hey, what if I get into the music business? What kind of music would I like? So um, at that point, um, I was really disappointed in New Order. Um, thing is, is they were actually one of the uh, most successful independent bands in the world uh, before they signed a major uh, record label and then started sounding more like a regular radio band. And so I was kind of, eh, it's kind of heartbroken. I was kind of over them. But then... I was getting into Frontline Assembly a little bit more. Like, we'd already been listening to him, but it's like they were, um, it seemed like every album was getting better and better, and then he had a lot of side projects. So, you know, at the time, I was saying something to my dad, like, you know, if I ever got into the music business, I wouldn't want to just play one style of music. I'd kind of want to do a variety of styles, maybe. And he said, you know, like maybe, like, it would all be electronic, but I'd, I'd play with different styles. And he said something like, no, don't do that. Then you could end up like David Byrne of Talking Heads, who went off and did all this cheesy sounding stuff. Well, Bill Lieb kind of proves my point by doing that because um, he's done everything from more of like a really hardcore industrial style that um, some people would say it's like the electronic equivalent to heavy metal. And then kind of more like um, more like his version of techno and then onto stuff that's more like kind of pop with female vocals. So like when he put out um, Delirium Semantic Spaces, I really appreciated that because I'm like, you know, that's the kind of thing I would do, right? Yeah, you know, it just seemed like something that my dad and his friends thought was cool about me is that I had good taste in music because I was listening to industrial music and stuff like that. And that's why I thought, you know, Bill Lee was probably going to like me because I could tell he's, uh sounds like he was also into the same type of music that we've been listening to. And then, as you see, I've got my New Order poster. I don't know if you can see that, but that's New Order and then Front 242. And that's me with my bird captain. So let me tell you about a captain, huh? El Capitano. So when my grandpa died, um, there wasn't anyone really handling this bird much. So I started handling captain and I got to take him home. So so from where I was sitting, we would have captain up on his perch there over his poo-poo paper. And the, the ferrets would be running, playing, and bird would be up there laughing and carrying on. The funny thing about this bird is he really liked Doritos. So if you handed him a Dorito, he'd sit there and he'd eat it nice and slow and make sure he tasted it up real good in his mouth. But one day, we handed Captain a plain tortilla chip and he took it and he looked at it like... And he just threw it right on the floor like, what the hell is this, huh? Right? <laughs> so anyways, here's some nice shots of Captain. Captain Clunkum. And he used to make this little sound that's like, clunk em, clunk em. So I'd always say, Captain, Captain Clunk em. He's a funny animal. Now in uh, 12th grade, uh, Janet was all gone, but I had a new friend, Milan Bujus Rice. So I met, uh, I think his name was pronounced Milan. I met him in art class because I was wearing a Front 242 t-shirt. And his favorite band was Leibach. And so he would uh, tell me about uh, back in Croatia and how him and his friends were into industrial music. And I think he knew somebody from Leibach and they were going to these house parties and stuff. So it was really kind of fun listening to his side of things. Now, his dad was involved in uh, the symphony business. Like he would bring stuff to Key West, you know, and uh, it's kind of funny. He and I were sitting there listening to Leibach one day and his dad walks in and he goes, oh, so you like that junky music too, huh? So <laughs> unfortunately, I never got to bring him home to introduce him to my dad. And uh, and I really appreciate it if um, he's watching because I'm uh, still in contact with him on Facebook. So thank you for staying in touch after all these years. Yeah, so anyways, uh, moving on, um, got a few pictures of uh, my cousins there um, from 92, but these pictures are from... 94 that's the year I graduated from high school so as you see I didn't take it too seriously I kind of thought high school was a joke the only reason I finished high school was because I had put in too many years by the time I decided I wanted to drop out which I probably 11th grade I was thinking at so yeah, I'm like yeah so what right so fucking what and then there's grandma smith grandma smith and my dad on the other side and there's Steven, 
Uncle Chuck and Aunt Dar were there. Got another nice shot of them guys. And now these are pictures more from after I graduated and we're hanging out at a, a good friend of my grandma's. And there's a classic case of a Key West Pelican and then, yeah, that's what I looked like when I was uh, about 19. Yeah, so the year after I graduated, the summer I turned 19, um, yeah, I was going to work with my mom and uh, and borrowing her mopeds. I um, actually got to know Key West really well before I left for that reason. Otherwise, I really never got a chance to just really wander that much. So that was um, pretty fun. And uh, and so I was still training with Ron Curran. I'd, I'd use the mopeds to get to his house and we would train. And I learned Kempo over there more and more. And um, so I made some friends over there who lived over by my, where my mom was working. And then um, I also had the job working at this barbecue place. I was either washing, I was washing dishes and delivering for them because I could borrow the moped and really getting to know Key West even better. But I was going over to that house to hang out with those guys and smoke pot. And I met this guy named Nick over there. And, um, and he's like, so you want a boyfriend one day? And I'm like, eh, I'm not really interested in getting pregnant pregnant, you know, because I'm thinking, asking me if I want a boyfriend is really no different than asking me if I want to have sex, but eventually I did. He was, he was kind of a cute guy, you know, he's kind of interesting and stuff, and you know, I wasn't like that, it, you know, I wasn't that serious, but I let him screw me, unfortunately. Um, He accidentally knocked me up, and I had to go get an abortion, and I couldn't really talk about it to anyone but my mom, so she helped me take care of that. Anyways, um, yeah, I remember at some point trying to go to college for, um, graphic design, you know, so I got into the um, the prerequisites and stuff, but I didn't stick with it. Yeah, it was too difficult to get grant money because I was living with my parents, and so my dad paid for the first semester, hoping that would help get me going, but I didn't keep going with that. Instead, I just kind of focused on going back to work and, and keeping a job, so I think I ended up working at Publix and still training with Ron Curran. And uh, when he was getting ready to go to Ohio, he invited me to come with him. And I thought it would be a good idea to go up there and get my black belt because he was going to help make me an instructor. Well, I got all my stuff boxed up and everything. And I didn't know how to tell my dad that I wanted to, you know, to do this. So he caught me last minute and he got really mad about it. And he said, if Ron tries to come over and take me to Ohio, he's probably going to end up kicking his ass, right? Anyways, um, we had that good friend from Michigan that uh, moved to Denver named Kelly. And he used to be my dad's best friend, you know. Well, anyways, I went up there and see that picture. That's where I ended up going to Shaolin. Yeah, as a result, that was my option. So that's a good thing. Yeah, so I made a trip to Denver um, before I moved there. I think uh, it was the summer I turned 20. I went up, I think, in August. And I saw uh, D. Krups and actually made contacts up there that I stayed in touch with. That'd be David Mendegorn and his sister's... Uh, Amy and Debbie. So, um, and then after that trip, I was like, I'm definitely going to Denver. So, you know, I came back to, uh, to Key West and I worked a little longer there at Publix, saved up. And then I, um, then I made the move and then eventually Captain did come to join me in Colorado. Anyways, um, yeah, so it was, uh, that would be the, the final days of, um, Key West. Now, I think my parents have been wanting to break up since before, um, I was even born and since before they even got married and ironically um the church they got married and I hear got hit by lightning and burnt down a year later <laughs> anyways funny thing is is yeah it's like they um they stayed married um my mom believed you should stay married until the kids are growing up and blah 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 and so with me going to Colorado my mom ended up going to Texas to live with her sister anyways you guys um <laughs> these have been my last years of living in Key West Florida I hope you have enjoyed hearing my stories, and if you're still here watching and you haven't gotten bored and wandered off, thank you very much. Take care, have a great day, and I will talk to you soon.